Well, thank you all very much for showing up. I know the weather is outstanding. Um, I'm Chris Darnton. I'm an assistant professor of politics at Catholic University in Northeast D.C. I'm very pleased to be here at the Wilson Center today to talk about my book on rivalry and alliance politics in Cold War Latin America. Um, and I should note, having been invited by the Washington History Seminar, I'm a political scientist by training. Um, so I will try to tamp down some of the disciplinary scaffolding um, and present a more interdisciplinary focused talk, largely focused on the evolution of the Argentine-Brazilian relationship during the Cold War in regional context, although I would be happy to talk about social science research design and comparative case studies in the Q&A if you would like. <laughs> So I want to do four things uh, in the talk, and I'll, I'll speak for about 45 minutes, and that'll leave 45 minutes for, for question and answers, and I very much look forward to your feedback. I'd like to do four things. Um, first of all, I'd like to present a narrative of the Argentine-Brazilian strategic relationship over the course of the second half of the 20th century. Um, from the end of World War II to the onset of the debt crisis in the early 1980s. Um, and this is an arc of foreign relations, of a bilateral relationship that goes from conflict to cooperation, that goes from a, a long-standing, deep-rooted historical rivalry to a diplomatic breakthrough to rapprochement that then paves the way for the era of Mercosur. And I stop well short of the domestic political difficulties that the Argentine and Brazilian governments find themselves embroiled in this year. Um, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to talk about the Argentine-Brazilian relationship uh, by focusing on four critical episodes. These are presidential summits, uh, high-level bilateral meetings where folks are pushing to overcome a traditional rivalry um, and push for a new era of cooperation. This is essentially a story of three funerals and a wedding. Because the first, the first three summits fail, some of them quite disastrously, and set back the bilateral relationship for years. Um, and the last one that I'm going to talk about in 1980 is really the pivotal turning point in the strategic relationship. Um, so one of my big questions with all of this is, given what we think of now as strategic cooperation between Argentina and Brazil, uh, in the Mercosur era, or even before that, going back to the, the democratic transitions of the 1980s, if cooperation was such a great idea, why didn't it happen earlier? Um, and a more focused way, I think, to tack into that question is, when cooperation had been proposed, as it was concretely, roughly once a decade over the course of the 20th century, what caused those initiatives to fail? Um, so this is essentially a failure analysis of, uh, of, of, of a series of cases. Um, and to do that, um, I largely draw on uh, research that I've done in the foreign ministry archives, uh, both in, in Brazil, just in the uh, Brasilia archive, not in Rio, um, and the Argentine foreign ministry archives um, in Buenos Aires. And I'd be happy to talk more about the, the documents as well in the Q&A. Um, I should extend my thanks to the foreign ministry staff and the archive staff in both countries for facilitating that analysis. Um, I can't entirely set aside the fact that I'm a political scientist and I'm trying to make a causal argument. I'm trying to explain the failure of these summits and the success of the 1980 diplomatic breakthrough in comparative perspective. Um, so let me start out with, for those of you who are not familiar with the Argentine-Brazilian relationship, a very brief snapshot of the, the long durée in Argentine-Brazilian relations. The photo on the left, this is uh, Colonia do Sacramento. This is a, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in present-day Uruguay uh, on the, the shores of the, the River Plate. This was contested by both Spanish and Portuguese empires in the New World, conquered and reconquered a dozen or so times, um, and this strategic competition between empires is then inherited by what becomes Argentina and becomes Brazil uh, in the New World. So this dates back to the late 18th century. Uh, and then on the right, we have a sketch of the Itaipu Dam, uh, the largest hydroelectric project in South America, put together by the Brazilians. And as late as the 1970s, these hydroelectric projects that the Argentine and Brazilian governments are working on, this is the issue that's at stake in the rivalry. These are competing projects. Um, turns out when you're trying to 
build a dam, it's affected by water flow, which is affected by what other people are doing upstream. So all of these things have to be done in consultation with one another. And this was a point of, of huge dispute between uh, Argentina and Brazil. So centuries apart, uh, 18th century and late 20th century. Um, this is what things look like in 1977. This is the cover of Veja, uh, Brazil's leading foreign affairs Weekly, you can see the arrows with national flags pointing in opposite directions. Brazil, Argentina, this encontro, the, the failure to understand, trains passing in the night, lack of cooperation as late as 1977. Um, so I'm trying to understand what maintains this conflict for so long. Um, one way to look into this comparatively over time to get a sense of what's happening in the bilateral relationship um, this is a chart I compiled based on a list available from the Argentine Foreign Ministry. This shows the number of, I realize part of this bar graph may be below the table depending on where you're sitting. Um, this is the number of bilateral accords signed in a particular year between Argentina and Brazil. This is a very rough first cut as to do we see anything cooperative happening? Um, are you not signing any new trade deals, um, any new consultation, uh, memoranda of understanding, joint texts? And the things to notice here, first of all, up through the mid-1930s, there's almost nothing. Right? The first few decades of the 20th century, there isn't a bilateral relationship. After that, you get sporadic years of a few accords being signed, followed by years of nothing. The big turning point, and the, the thing to notice here, what I'll call attention to, is the very high spike with 1980, just briefly, here. This is the turning point. Um, a couple of dozen bilateral accords are signed. Everything from diplomatic coordination to wheat sales to collaboration on conventional arms production to transparency in nuclear developments. This is a broad spectrum set of accords signed in 1980. And this paves the way for uh, democratic transition period, strategic cooperation, and Mercosur. Every succeeding year has built on this foundation of cooperation. So why does that pivot point happen when it does, and why do previous diplomatic efforts to achieve cooperation um, fail so badly? So I have an argument, and the argument ultimately is about organizational politics, something that I call parochial interest. And what I'm going to walk through in each of these summit cases is an argument that when well-meaning, perfectly intelligent, cooperation-desiring leaders sit down at the table, they are hampered from achieving bilateral cooperation, not because they don't trust one another, not because of hatred, misperceptions, nationalism, um, or because of the technical difficulties of the accord, but rather because of obstruction from within their own governments. And I argue that this is systematic, um, that it was driven largely by the armed services in both countries, not just the uniformed folks, but also the foreign ministries themselves. Um, so this is a brief schematic of why rivalry lasts so long and is so difficult to overcome. When you have an interstate rivalry, a protracted conflict, this provides useful missions for some government agencies that are tasked with national defense, that are tasked with foreign relations. Um, these missions provide useful things if you're a government agency. Things like budget share, things like organizational autonomy, often more important than budget share, uh, political power, and policy influence. So I am not at all arguing that military service branches are inventing rivalry for their own accords. Very much not. But once there is an externally given conflict, this becomes useful for sections of government. Um, and so they strive to maintain that. They develop vested interests in keeping rivalry going. And so if you happen to be a president of Argentina in the 1950s or 1960s, whether authoritarian or democratically elected, this is what you're going to bump up against when you try to overcome an external conflict. Um, and critically, the, the two bullet points at the bottom, if this is true, what should we see in the diplomacy of attempted cooperation? We should see presidents facing sabotage from within. Um, 
Sometimes this looks like a military coup or the threat of a military coup, but very often it's foot dragging. So my notion of sabotage here uh, is coming from Thorstein Veblen from early 20th century labor economics. Um, those of you in political science will be familiar with James Scott's argument about weapons of the weak um, and the way that there is nonviolent resistance to policies that you don't like. So a treaty can get signed but not implemented, a president can issue an order, and it can be essentially vetoed from within uh, by the organizational apparatus. So that's what I'm expecting to see. And presidents tend to get frustrated by those sorts of things. Um, I see presidents trying to conduct personal diplomacy. Well, let me bypass the State Department. I want to talk to my ambassador in the other country and use him as a personal envoy. Uh, or can I send a telegram myself or a letter to a foreign head of state? to negotiate directly and bypass the government. Um, and if all else fails, can I, can I go public? Can I reach out for public opinion support either at home or abroad to build momentum for cooperation? So end runs and sabotage are what we should see in some of these failed attempts at cooperation if this argument about parochial interest holds true. That's a very bleak story, so how do you get out of it? font size is a little small, I will uh, explain how this works. I'm focusing on the Cold War period, and one of the notable things about the Cold War is that we have a number of these protracted interstate rivalries on the same side. This is where two countries are aligned with the same superpower, they ostensibly have the same uh, uh, set of enemies, set of threat perceptions, and they still can't cooperate. I'm less surprised or less puzzled by a uh, PRC-Taiwan rivalry or an India-Pakistan rivalry, Ethiopia-Somalia, where both sides are receiving military assistance from opposing superpowers. But it's a little weird, it's a little perplexing to me when the rivalries are on the same side. And the bulk of these, as I lay out in some detail uh, in the book, are in Latin America. So why is it that Latin American countries can't overcome territorial disputes and rivalries during the Cold War when they're aligned with, not, I was about to say U.S. interests, not always with U.S. interests, but at least aligned with Washington very broadly uh, during the context of the Cold War. Two things, I argue, you need in order to overcome all of this resistance from within. One, you need something else for those agencies to do. And in Cold War Latin America, this largely uh, is about internal repression. This is when the Cold War really hits home, rather than being an abstract sense of, well, we're aligned against the Soviet Union, but when the armed forces start turning inward and dealing with insurgent threats um, and repressive missions, this gives them something to do other than prepare for the external threat posed by rivalry. And that's not always good enough. You might need a catalyst to give up the old mission of rivalry that was so useful to you over all of these decades. And that, I argue, is coming from resource constraints. Right? So if you experience a, a tightening of, uh, of, your, of your budget, of your available resources for the country, you've got to start making sacrifices, and you make policy trade-offs. So if you have both of those things, that should open some political space and get leaders to be able to achieve rapprochement without all this obstruction. So what does that look like? It's what I call routine diplomacy. It means when we see a cooperative breakthrough, leaders should sign a treaty and it gets implemented. Uh, leaders propose a visit, and you don't hear any objections, you don't hear any coup threats uh, when, they, when they go abroad. So leaders should be able to delegate to the bureaucracy, and it should actually get implemented. That's what I'm looking for. This is the cover of the book, so I'm going to walk through four case studies. Like I said, three funerals and a wedding. So this is the first funeral. Uh, Gentleman in the, the pinstripes on the left is Eurico Gaspar Dutra, president of Brazil. Uh, this is May of 1947. And on the right in peaked cap is Juan Perón of Argentina. So this is the early Cold War here, 1947. Immediate post-war period. Um, Argentina is trying to get back, reintegrate itself into the inter-American community. Uh, had been largely neutral for most, most of the Second World War. Um, but by the spring of 1947, the Truman administration is ready to welcome Argentina back uh, into, into the fold. Um, the highest priority for the Truman administration at this point with respect to the Western Hemisphere is to obtain a Rio Treaty. And Truman himself goes to Rio for this purpose. Uh, 
um, in August of 47 uh, when, when Dutra is president. So obtaining uh, this alliance relationship, this collective security agreement in 1947, this is what the U.S. is looking for. The Cold War threat is very remote for most of Latin America at this point. Um, Anti-communism as an ideology is present. The idea of a geopolitical alignment with Washington against Moscow means something. Um, but if you're Argentina or Brazil, you are not facing leftist insurgencies at this point. That's a long ways uh, a long ways down the road. At this point, even the United States is saying that when Latin America prepares to fight the Cold War, mostly what that means is conventional defense in case the Soviet Union invades the Western Hemisphere. Um, it takes several years for that understanding to, uh, to collapse. So what happens? We have a presidential summit. What they're doing in this photograph, by the way, they're untying a ribbon to inaugurate a bridge uh, between Uruguayana and Paso de los Libres. Argentina and Brazil have been, well, Brazil achieves its independence in 1822. So from 1822 until uh, the end of World War II, there's a river that separates the two largest countries in South America, and there's no way to get across except by boat. Um, the first bridge is built during the war and inaugurated in 1947, and that's what they're launching. Again, this takes a long time even to have the very beginnings of, of cooperation. Um, there's almost no secondary scholarship on this episode, mostly because it's what we call in political science a negative case. Not all that much happens. Um, Time magazine has a very derisive couple of paragraphs um, that, that nothing, nothing really was happening here. In fact, the U.S., this is a blip on, on the radar because uh, for the Truman administration, this comes May 1947, smack between the Truman Doctrine speech and the launch of the Marshall Plan. So you can comb the memoirs of uh, Kennan and Acheson and everybody else, and there's no mention that anything's happening in South America. This is completely off the radar. So why is more not done? Why do we not have rapprochement when both of these governments, by the way, democratically elected, uh, both pretty staunchly anti-communist, both getting along with the Truman administration, a number of common interests. In fact, they spent much of their time talking about communism and talking about jointly intervening in a civil war in neighboring Paraguay. Um, so why doesn't more happen? The argument largely is that they are facing opposition from both of their own militaries and both of their own foreign ministries. Um, and when I look at the documents, particularly uh, in Brazil and the, from the Brazilian foreign ministry, especially looking at cables between the Brazilian embassy in Argentina and the Brazilian foreign ministry headquarters, um, we see an expression of surprise that the presidents actually agreed on so much. Um, this, was, this was seen as somewhat threatening. So when uh, an Ar Argentine economic advisor says, we're spending too much on defense, for the purpose of threatening one another, and we can't do good business because neither of us has the resources to, to buy one another's goods, let's have coordinated defense spending reductions. Uh, red flags start going up in the foreign ministries and in the military that this is going to be completely unacceptable. We also have a number of end runs. Uh, the guy who, until January of 1947, had been the Brazilian ambassador in Argentina, seems to have taken it upon himself as a personal mission to broker peace between the two countries. So the first thing he does in being inaugurated as, uh, or being uh, approved as ambassador in, in Buenos Aires um, is to start striking deals, to start setting meetings. He's the one who brokers this summit in the first place. And there's a whole series of cables from the Brazilian foreign ministry headquarters saying, slow it down, calm down, do not blow this out of proportion. You are exceeding your instructions. Um, doing anything beyond the, the merely perfunctory uh, was off limits as far as far as his diplomatic instructions. And uh, Perón, not only does this summit in '47 not produce the results that he's looking for, he keeps at it. Um, and Vargas, or sorry, uh, Dutra's predecessor and successor, Getulio Vargas, Perón and Vargas maintain a back-channel, almost flirtatious dialogue, trying to get another summit to happen, trying to get the strategic breakthrough. When this ultimately fails, Perón gives a speech in 1953 at the Higher War College uh, lambasting Vargas's 
cravenness, uh, in inability to stand up to this obstructionism within his own government, um, and saying that he needs to put his pants on and deal with the special interests. Um, so this is a source of some frustration to leaders who are trying to achieve a cooperative breakthrough in the early Cold War. Well, this happens about once a decade. Dutra and Perón are not the only people who try to achieve some sort of cooperative turning point, try to overcome the traditional Argentine-Brazilian rivalry. These sorts of summits happen about once a decade, which in itself should tell us something. Because if rivalry is about hatred and mistrust um, and uh, inability to reach an accord, how do they manage to sit at the table with one another so frequently? So this, I think, the, the, the frequency of these summits, particularly for countries that are, that are not superpowers, that have fewer resources at their disposal, this is a big deal. It shows that the will is there. The political will at a high level is there to reach, uh, to reach an accord. So 1961 is the next presidential summit. On the left, Janio Cuadros of Brazil. On the right, Arturo Frondizi uh, of Argentina. Again, both democratically elected. So at this point, the Cold War has changed from the late 40s to the beginning of the 1960s in Latin America. And the big turning point here is the Cuban Revolution. So January of 1959, uh, Fidel Castro and company uh, take over in Havana. And this has ripple effects throughout the hemisphere, most immediately and most significantly for the small countries of the Caribbean basin uh, and, and Central America where the threat is felt most acutely. It's still somewhat peripheral for Cuadros and Frondizi. For them, uh, Cuba matters, the Cuban Revolution matters, but it's more of a foreign policy issue than a true domestic insurgent threat as of 1961. So when they're meeting, the two presidents are meeting uh, in, in April of 1961, one of the biggest agenda items is actually pledging allegiance to the U.S.'s core foreign policy objective, which for the Kennedy administration at this point is the Alliance for Progress. The Alliance for Progress, Kennedy announces uh, in a speech in Washington in March of 1961, Quadros and Frondizi meet in April, and they subscribe to the full tenets. I have a separate paper where I'm lar largely arguing that this is because they were Brazilian ideas in the first place, um, so it's some somewhat easy to get the Brazilians and the, the Argentines to, to agree to this sort of thing. Um, but nonetheless, the core objectives that the U.S. is stating in 1961 for the hemisphere, both Brazil and Argentina are on board. And this is important because one often reads, and I've, I've tried to engage scholarship from Argentina and Brazil, so South American analyses of, of these stories, um, and there's a line of argument that the failures of Argentina and Brazil to meet and cooperate are due to U.S. meddling. So... I'm trying to argue that that's not the case, first of all, because when these leaders meet, they're agreeing with the United States. And secondarily, it's not U.S. meddling because nobody in Washington's paying attention. Um, and I, I have some external validation of this because when I was writing the book, this was largely based on South American archives. Um, since then, I've spent some time at the National Archives in College Park, and one of the things that I've done is read through the, the complete set of the classified records of the U.S. Embassy in Buenos Aires from about 1958 to 1962. So all of the paperwork that we had in the embassy in that period of time, and nobody's keeping tabs of the Argentines' relationships with Brazil. So you get folder after folder about Argentine steel policy and folder after folder about Peronist electoral successes on a local and provincial basis and almost nothing about the bilateral relationship with Brazil. Um, there is one mention that this summit happened in the entire foreign relations of the United States series. The U.S. is not paying attention. Ergo, it's not our fault. Right? So what happened? What happened? Um, there's a great anecdote in the memoirs of the foreign minister of Brazil, Afonso Rinos Chimelo Franco, uh, who was there for this summit. And he's reporting in his memoirs that he's standing next to, to Quadros. Quadros and Frondizi are reaching breakthrough after breakthrough. Right? They actually, unlike the 1947 summit, they reach a number of accords. They have a great declaration. Um, the town that they're meeting in on the border is called Uruguayana. So they have the declaration of Uruguayana. Um, and in the immediate honeymoon aftermath, um, this is referred to as the spirit of Uruguayana, the idea of a strategic breakthrough for Argentina and Brazil. 
So they're reaching all of these accords. Uh, the foreign minister of Brazil reports that after the Argentine president, Frondizi, is agreeing to all of this, the, the, the members of his delegation start getting very worried that he's reaching all of these agreements with the Brazilians. Um, and so the Argentine foreign minister says, but isn't the president going to consult? Frondizi's response is, consult with whom? Right? Implicitly, I'm the president. I get to reach these sorts of accords. But the understanding is you need to seek prior approval from the armed forces before signing anything with the Brazilians. So Quadros, president of Brazil, walks away um, and says to his foreign minister, no president should have to submit himself to this. Um, this is backed up by a lot of the cables from the Brazilian embassy in, uh, in Argentina, back to headquarters, reporting on the tremendous degree of outright tutelage that Frondizi faces in foreign policy. He has to get prior approval um, to leave the country, to sign any sort of uh, decree. Anything, everything is parsed through the lens of you might be going soft on communism. Um, and uh, to the point that uh, Frondizi, before he leaves for Brazil for the summit, receives a warning from Admiral Gaston Clement, who was the Argentine naval secretary. It doesn't explicitly threaten a coup, but it says it might be wise to postpone this summit indefinitely because there could be domestic repercussions. I mean, it's left to the president who had faced a few dozen military crises with his own armed forces to determine how to respond to that. And ultimately, Quadros resigns uh, under fire in August of uh, 1961, and Frondizi is overthrown by his armed forces in the spring of 1962, and the spirit of Uruguayana is dead. And if it wasn't thoroughly buried, it became thoroughly buried with the Brazilian coup of uh, March 1964 and the Argentine coup of 1966, launching a period of bureaucratic authoritarianism. So here the Cold War has arrived. We've got the Cuban Revolution. Argentina and Brazil are on the same side. They still can't reach this breakthrough. And it's not because the presidents can't get along and they don't have a joint declaration. It's because of obstruction from within. A decade later, March of 1972, now both countries are under military rule. Um, and here we have uh, President Lanús of Argentina, uh, just left of center. And just right of center, we have Emilio Medici of Brazil. This is a real failure, diplomatically. Um, and here we get a very, very anodyne joint declaration. No new treaties are signed. Um, and this is surprising. If, if we can go back in time and envision uh, reading, reading the newspapers, reading the newsweeklies like Veja, waiting for this summit to happen, there's a great degree of public optimism that finally Argentina and Brazil, thoroughly anti-communist, both facing pretty significant internal security threats. Um, for Argentina, things are about to get a lot worse over the course of the mid-1970s, but Argentina is facing, even in the early 1970s, a great deal of um, urban terrorism, car bombings, that sort of thing. Brazil, as of March 1972, is facing not only urban terrorism and insurgency, but actually a renewed rural insurgency uh, in the Amazon hinterlands in Pará, and Brazil is mobilizing its largest internal security operation in, I think, the entire 20th century, about 20,000 troops to go to quell an insurgency. Both of these guys are in pretty good with the Nixon administration, um, so they're aligned with the United States, anti-communist, military regimes, internal Cold War-related threats, still can't get it done. This is the official photo op. They are not happy. They have not achieved any sort of breakthrough. So why was that? Well, if you go and look at the classified documents, rather than what was being published uh, in the news when everybody was expecting this to be a breakthrough and then surprised when it collapses, inside the government, nobody's surprised. Uh, because in the lead up to this, they realize that uh, the, the substance is simply not there. You don't have the, the trust and the working relationships um, on both sides. The other thing that's particularly fascinating to read a South American historiography, South American analyses of, uh, of this case, the standard line is that this summit collapses because of a gaffe. The Argentine president is uh, giving, giving a speech at the Brazilian foreign ministry headquarters in Brasilia, um, and he goes off script for a couple of sentences. And in particular, he makes reference to these high, competing hydroelectric projects that I mentioned earlier, the, the dam construction. Um, and he 
supposedly offends Brazilian sovereignty by including a couple of lines in his speech about uh, Argentine territorial integrity that had not been pre-approved. So the Brazilians say this is, this is clearly an intentional act by the Argentines uh, to, to provoke us, um, and the Argentines seem to think that this is the Brazilians sort of using, using this as a, as a pretext um, to kill off cooperation. When I look at the, uh, the Argentine ar archival documents from the foreign ministry from uh, 1971 and 1972, again, you get this sense that, A, uh, there's not going to be any sort of a cooperative breakthrough. Um, there isn't a degree of trust. But you also get very clearly this idea that Brazil does not like it when people go off script. Right? And you particularly do not do that um, in the headquarters of the Brazilian foreign ministry itself. So you see all the back and forth pre-approving every text, pre-approving the translation into other languages. The Argentine foreign ministry knew that any deviation uh, is going to be seized upon as an opportunity. I don't, I don't want to blame the Brazilians for, for this intransigence because you also see uh, on the Argentine side ideas that you know, if the Brazilians don't agree to anything, uh, we can use that, we can blame them for the failure of cooperation. So there's a lot of preparation on both sides on laying the groundwork to level blame in the event of eventual failure. So what I'm arguing is it doesn't matter what the president says or doesn't say in his dinner toast because any pretext any pro is going to be seized upon um, in, in order to scuttle a cooperative breakthrough with, between the two countries. One other thing that I will mention about, about this case, I mentioned we need two things, according to the argument that I'm launching, um, to have a successful cooperative breakthrough. One is this alternative mission for these agencies. That's particularly the internal security mission. It's not really there in 47 yet because everybody's idea of the Cold War common foe is troops sailing out of the Soviet Union. Um, in 1961, things are getting a little more acute because the Cuban Revolution has happened, but Argentina and Brazil are not facing early significant insurgencies. By 72, the threat is there. Um, so for putting on the disciplinary hat for a moment, for a realist argument that expects cooperation is largely going to come from threat levels, this is the really surprising case. Because here you've got uh, a pretty significant threat for both countries. But the resource constraint is not there. This is the height of the Brazilian miracle when you've got double-digit economic growth every year. Um, and so you don't have these incentives for trade-offs. You have the obstruction um, you have presidents you know, sort of flirting with some diplomatic end runs, um, but you do not have a success. This changes dramatically over the course of the 1970s. Here's the successful breakthrough uh, in 1980. This is João Figueiredo on the left and Jorge Videla on the right, um, sharing a glass of champagne. This looks actually... A little friendly, maybe a little more than friendly. Uh, so here's a political cartoon from the same time period, uh, sort of Romeo and Juliet. We have Videla serenading Figueiredo uh, on guitar, uh, clasping his hands, uh, clearly enchanted. Here we have an Uruguayan political cartoon, the same two guys sharing a gourd of mate with a witty, uh, witty poem basically saying that Brazil and Argentina are finally achieving their destiny um, and acting all friendly. This is a big deal because this is an Uruguayan cartoon. And historically, Uruguay, Paraguay, the small countries in between have much to fear from the idea of coordination between the regional great powers, Argentina and Brazil. So why does this breakthrough occur? Particularly in 1980, again, this is puzzling for a sort of threat-driven realist argument. Because by 1980, Argentina has entirely wiped out its insurgent threat. Right? Um, so the threat isn't there. But what I'm arguing is that the mission continues. Once the armed forces have sort of redirected themselves to deal with a communist threat, to deal with an internal security mission rather than rivalry, that persists. There's a sense of inertia. There's a sense of maintaining, uh, maintaining that mission. So what changed over the course of the 1970s? The economies started to tank. 
Um, those of you familiar with the state of, La of Latin America's regional economy, you know that the debt crisis comes in in the 1980s. This is commonly pegged to Mexico's default on its foreign debt in 1982. Um, again, reading diplomatic cables, reading people's assessment of one another's economies, th this was coming for a long time. Uh, this is, nobody's magically surprised in 1982 that there's a problem with debt burdens, um, that the economy, that the import substitution industrialization is expiring, that inflation is out of control. These problems unfold over the course of the late 1970s. And I think the real turning point here, particularly on the Brazilian side, is the October 1973 oil shock. Um, this is back in the days before Brazil discovered major oil reserves and had to import everything, when as a developing country that's trying to heavily industrialize, um, it's importing all of these resources, which is why it's also working on hydroelectric programs, uh, ethanol, nuclear energy, etc. cetera. Um, so the economies are starting to tank in the late 1970s, and this in conjunction with the anti-communist internal security mission, I'm arguing, opens this political space where the leaders should be able to achieve a breakthrough. And again, thinking about the kinds of diplomatic behaviors we should see, if this is right, if the, the economic incentives and the uh, internal security incentives are aligned, finally the bureaucracy should actually cooperate. Presidents should be able to implement treaties. They should be able to delegate the negotiations to the diplomats and have that actually work out. And they should be relatively immune from any sort of uh, internal opposition from within the military to these sorts of cooperative breakthroughs. And this, I argue, does happen. Brazil is a military, uh, military regime from 1964 through 1985. Argentina has another military coup in 1976, and that regime lasts until redemocratization in 83. So I find particularly interesting the period from the Argentine coup in 76 through this breakthrough in 1980. Um, when both countries finally are, are seeing eye to eye, they have a similar regime type, shared values, anti-communism, aligned somewhat with the United States during the Cold War. Um, one of the reasons they're not quite aligned with the US during the Cold War is that Jimmy Carter is elected um, in 1976. And Carter launches not only a promotion of a human rights agenda, uh, globally, but particularly in inter-American relations. And this creates what the Argentine uh, dictatorship and the Brazilian regime see as unacceptable interference in domestic affairs. Um, they are angry with Carter. Um, they are angry over the, uh, the human rights inquiries. And not just human rights, but also nuclear energy, right? which the Brazilians are, are very sensitive about. Right? This is a uh, it's a matter of technological autonomy, it's a matter of economic development, it's a matter of prestige, of grandeza, and this is, again, unacceptable interference from the United States. So there's a certain, I see a certain irony in the fact that Argentina and Brazil finally achieve strategic cooperation not in line with United States interests during the Cold War, but precisely when they're both rather ticked off at Washington. Um, there are lines of argument in Latin American scholarship that say there is no irony to be seen here. Of course you should see Latin American cooperation against the United States if it's ever going to happen, right? that the U.S. is the common foe. I don't see that quite, uh, quite borne out in the documents, but I think it's an interesting, interesting contrast. So from the 76 coup through 1980, a few things change. Early on, there's the same pattern of diplomatic behavior. Presidential end runs. Uh, Videla sends direct cables to President Geisel in Brazil, you know, pledging to, to work directly. Videla, despite the fact that he's hemmed in by the Navy, by some of his own um, opponents within the Argentine military, personally handpicks the ambassador to Brazil. And he picks a guy who uh, is known for being a proponent of Argentine-Brazilian cooperation. So again, this use of personal envoys, direct diplomacy. Uh, the Argentine ambassador in Brazil is trying to drum up public diplomacy in support of Argentine-Brazilian rapprochement. This is what it looks like in 76 and 77. And this keeps failing. The foreign ministries on both sides are really irked 
that ambassadors and presidents are trying to make foreign policy because foreign policy is supposed to be the central mission of the foreign ministry, um, or if you are in the military high command, you think that's your job too. Um, so when the civilians, when the, the folks outside the bureaucracy are getting involved in foreign policy making, this must be shut down, particularly if they're trying to achieve uh, a cooperative breakthrough. By 1978 and into 1979, this has changed, particularly because the economic pressures are getting so acute, I argue, um, that there is, there is this trade-off, that finally the bureaucracies are getting on board, the armed forces are okay with strategic cooperation, <laughs> And so when you get the breakthroughs over the course of 1979, reaching an agreement on the hydroelectric projects, um, and all of those, that big spike in treaties in 1980 that I showed at the beginning on that chart that's happening at the summit, this had all been worked out in advance. Unlike some of the previous summits, this is not presidents reaching a deal on the back of a napkin and then seeking approval. These things had been drafted within the bureaucracies and signed off on in advance. So this had organizational support um, by, the time, by the time of that summit. Just to give you a couple of figures, I've been giving this in a very narrative sense of when threats are emerging, when repression is happening, um, and when resource constraints are coming in. So let me just show a couple of slides. Um, this is a very basic metric of state repression, of the emergence of an internal mission for Argentina and Brazil. Um, the red line is the number of torture allegations in Brazil uh, from 1964 through 1977. And this spikes in the late 1960s with some of the institutional acts, the AIs, um, that the Brazilian mili military regime is launching. And it declines over the course of the 70s as the Brazilian military regime starts the distance, the relaxation, and then eventual political opening. But the internal mission is really coming in after the coup in the late 60s, somewhat in response to and somewhat proactively against leftist insurgency. For Argentina, this shows up a little later. The big spike in repression, that blue line, is the number of disappearances annually um, in, in Argentina. Um, so this is pretty cold-blooded numbers, and this is also apples and oranges. In Argentina, the regime tends to kill a lot of people. In Brazil, they don't kill very many people, but they do torture an awful lot. Um, and I don't want to make light of that, but I do want to say that this, this is a metric of security forces doing things domestically on a large scale that they had not been doing on a large centralized scale before. So the military mission, the internal mission is there in the 1970s. And the economy is tanking. These are annual GDP growth rates for Argentina and Brazil. And you can see the basic trend is things go up from the 40s to the early 70s. And then things decline with a lot of year-to-year -year noise throughout the 1980s. You see a similar story with the debt service. right? De total debt service as a percentage of, of GDP or gross, na uh, gross national income. Um, rising, 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 rising through the, uh, the 1970s peaking around the onset of the debt crisis and then going down with some of the renegotiation. The mission is there, the crisis shows up, the economies are under strain, and finally you get that political space, change in diplomatic behavior, and success in 1980. Lastly, I want to talk a little bit about some policy lessons. Um, I'm not going to go into detail on this, um, and certainly being invited by a group of historians, I'm not going to stretch the analogy to death, uh, but I, I will suggest that I think there are some interesting parallels, that there are some useful lessons that we can take from inter-American relations during the Cold War to the era of international coalition building in the post-9-11 era of global counterterrorism. I am not the first person to draw these parallels. Um, Catherine Sicking's book, uh, Mixed Signals, 2004, I think, was, draws some early parallels about the, the human rights abuses by U.S. allies. Um, but this isn't just critics launching these lines of argument. Um, if you look back at a lot of the policy documents from the George W. Bush administration around 2006, National Strategy for Countering Terrorism, a National Security Strategy, we see parallels the ideas of a long war, that this long war is going to have an ideological as well as a military component, that the U.S. is going to need to rely on local frontline partners to do counterinsurgency. Um, again, I think all this is a very direct parallel with what we saw with U.S. allies during the Cold War. Um, again, unintended consequences. There's rivalries among 
U.S. coalition partners against terrorism today the same way that there were in Cold War Latin America among U.S. allies. So this photo is from President Obama's speech at West Point last spring, um, and some similar lines in that speech run through the uh, this year's national security strategy document. Although the language of long war has been eliminated uh, from, from uh, national security strategy, the line about building partner capabilities for, for counterterrorism, um, devolving responsibilities onto allies, and providing billions of dollars in new assistance to make that happen, that's still a core counterterrorism priority. And one of the things that I argue in the book is when you start providing these resources, you undermine the resource constraints that might incentivize cooperation. Um, so I can talk further in Q&A about uh, some of the policy lessons. I will also briefly note, I've been telling this story about Argentina and Brazil in part because this is where I'm mustering the archival documents in the book. This is, I think, where I've got the, the finest grained evidence on diplomatic behavior. Um, but there are other chapters in the book looking at, uh, in comparative perspective, the other rivalries in Latin America, looking at rivalries in Central America during the time of the Cuban Revolution, again, facing this internal mission, and rivalries in the Andes during the 1980s during the debt crisis when everybody's facing these really massive resource constraints. So it's not just an Argentina-Brazil book, um, but that's the more historically oriented talk that I'm trying to give today. With that, thank you all very much for showing up, and I look forward to your questions. Stated, um, and um, um, I think uh, a, a lot of food for thought and for your comments and questions. Let me perhaps start out since we're um, at the Wilson Center. Um, uh, could you just talk for a moment about uh, the archives uh, in Argentina and Brazil and um, what the situation <coughs> there is, how you found working there, and uh, what else? Yet, and maybe some and some of the other archival frontiers, um, and you know, of course, we at the um, Cold War International History Project here would be would love to uh, 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 share or make some of these these documents available to others as well through our digital archives. So um, um, you know, we can discuss that, that later on. But anyhow, okay. Great, thank you. So the question is about the archives, right? Where where are the documents? What do we learn from this? The answer is somewhat different on the Argentine side and the Brazilian slide. So inside the Argentine Foreign Ministry archives, um, a couple of points. First of all, I think it's great that a number of Cold War scholars are going into Latin American archives and, and uh, elsewhere in uh, former, uh, former Eastern Bloc countries and uh, developing countries. The archival situation is somewhat different than those of you who have visited College Park might have, uh, might have experienced. So... Um, <laughs> And I, I love Mark Trachtenberg's book uh, on the, the craft of international history, but there's a line in there that says archival, archival research is fairly straightforward. First you get the finding aids, and then you move on. Okay, so first rule of conducting our, uh, archival research, and there are no finding aids. Um, this makes life somewhat difficult. On the left, this is a mural that I saw in the hallway of the Argentine Foreign Ministry archives uh, when I was there in 2007, and it depicts an an employee of the archive upside down being eaten alive by a stack of binders. Um, and above it, it says the, the old archive in Zepita, right? So the sort of mistakes not to replicate. Um, Argentine Foreign Ministry archive for a long time was in a warehouse on the very far outskirts of, of Buenos Aires. Um, the plan is, and I'm not sure as of 2015 what stage uh, of implementation this is, but the plan is to use part of the old foreign ministry headquarters building as a new dignified repository for, for the history of the nation. Um, another mural in the building said that the, the history of diplomatic relations is part of the history of the Argentine Republic, and I think that's absolutely true. You know, foreign relations history should be unified with national history. So I was there in an intermediate location um, that on the, in the Prefectura Naval, the naval prefecture is part of the port facility in Buenos Aires, there was a warehouse, and the warehouse held everything, and they were in the middle of trying to get their own stuff organized. So I was the only researcher there uh, by the, again, I must extend thanks to the foreign ministry for letting me do this, um, basically hanging out with the staff and trying to find things. 
Um, there are a number of thematic series, so the Argentine Foreign Ministry archives are, are organized, um, and I was told pretty up front, most of these are going to be fully off limits to you. Um, so for instance, there's a series on Chile, no dice, although I have seen other people, Argentines, who have, who have cited documents from that series. There is a series on the Malvinas, the Falklands, don't even ask. Um, <laughs> So I restricted myself to one series, um, which uh, was uh, Fondo 47, uh, which was the uh, South America, 1950 to 1985. This seemed manageable. There were about 500 boxes of documents, no finding aids. Um, so I said, all right, I'm going to limit my search to here, and I'm going to come up with what I can come up with. Um, just a couple of not necessarily representative boxes, but just show what you're up against. Sometimes you open one of these. These are metal, by the way, filing boxes um, near saltwater in a not terribly insulated building. So sometimes you open it and it's a mess because the documents are, are not organized. People were literally stuffing these things into boxes 40 years ago and then forgetting about them. Um, the binder on the bottom, you won't be able to read the logo on the spine, but it says Argentina, Brazil, Political Relations, 1977, Volume 2. So degraded by water um, that the smell of rot emanates from the box. You cannot turn a page. So this is really depressing when you want to go in and read about Argentine-Brazilian political relations in 1977. Um, so you find what you find. Um, as an example, archival search strategies, um, the document in the lower right-hand corner, this was one of those where I was really excited. I sort of stand up at the table, and I'm, I'm happy that I found something. This is a briefing memorandum for the Argentine president, Jorge Videla, prior to his summit uh, in 1980 with uh, João Figueiredo, Brazil. Um, and I'm excited because there's no classification marking, so I, um, and I'm excited because this is from, from the event that I'm looking at. I'm excited because most of the scholars who've looked at this event say Argentina and Brazil have a breakthrough because Figueiredo grew up in Argentina when his dad was in exile, so he sort of secretly loves the Argentines, um, hence those romantic you know, political cartoons. And the briefing memo says, yeah, he kind of likes Argentina, but that's not why he's doing any of this, right? He has, uh, he has other strategic reasons for it. The trouble is that this document shows up in a folder that's labeled miscellaneous papers, and the folder is in a box that says Bolivia. <laughs> um, so you only get that by going through everything because there's, you know, there aren't the, aren't the finding aids. Brazil was much better organized, um, and which, which I very much appreciated, but it meant having to ask for permission to see different things and, and getting a piece of the story at the time. So the stories are, are very different in the two countries. Great. Great. Happy to talk about archives. We should get other questions. Thank you. All right. The floor is open for your questions. Yes. Please wait for the microphone and identify yourself before you speak. Hello. My name is Sarah. I'm a historian from Brazil, and I studied the Cold War. I would like to know, um, for us that live in South America, uh, until now, Argentina is a very difficult neighbor because no matter why, they want to oppose to every project. And that's the reason why Mercosur doesn't work ever. Um, but uh, during the 60s, uh, both Argentina and Brazil were together in the Operation Condor. Could you tell us about the Operation Condor and if it somehow related to the Cold War in a way that there was a, a support from USA, for example? Sure, great. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with, uh, with Operation Condor, this was launched in 1975 by Augusto Pinochet of Chile, um, and it's a collaborative intelligence-sharing counterinsurgency human rights abusing project. Um, this leads, among other things, to the car bombing on Embassy Row uh, and the assassination of Orlando Letelier, uh, who had been the foreign minister under Salvador Allende in Chile. Um, so there is this cooperation that happens in the 19, uh, late 1970s among the security apparatus, not only of Argentina and Brazil, uh, but also of Paraguay and Bolivia and, and Chile, etc. So this is there. Um, I think this in some ways is indicative of the missions that these countries' militaries are looking at, right? This internal focus rather than external. And in fact, direct collaboration with former adversaries against an internal security threat. Um, I think 
I can't draw a direct line from the Condor cooperation to this breakthrough in 1980 without telling the economic story because these operations remain very compartmentalized. They don't spill over into the military uh, as a whole. So it's a limited units that are really involved in this Condor stuff. Um, and largely the civilians, the diplomats, the foreign ministries are not participating in Condor. Mostly, although to get back to the question about archives, one of the things that you sometimes trip across, even in the civilian documents, the sort of memoranda and cables coming back from embassies, are occasion every time a citizen of a country is arrested or detained, a cable goes to the home country saying, we've arrested one of your people. Do you want him back? What should we do? Um, and sometimes these are long lists, sometimes it's, you know, and I don't know, I don't have the follow-up from that, right? I haven't seen here are the orders of, of what to do, but I sometimes wondered, right, if you cross-tabulate these lists with lists of the disappeared, right, what do you, what do you come up with? So, yeah, I think this is co uh, cooperation. It's clearly linked to the Cold War threat perception, but I don't see a direct spillover to the diplomatic breakthroughs in 1980. Not related to USA at all. A lot of the documents that have come out, um, this is stuff that I have not looked at directly, but uh, my understanding, a lot of the documents that are coming out being declassified from the, the Ford years, looking at um, Henry Kissinger's time as, as Secretary of State, I think there's a little more hand in glove, a little more awareness than, than we had earlier thought was the, was the case, that it looked very tacit, that we were happy with some of the anti-communism, but it seems a little more closely involved. That said... I don't think Condor is a U.S. idea. I give absolute credit to Latin Americans for coming up with uh, either useful or, or really horrible ideas all on their own. So I'm in favor of agency on that. But, but anyway. well, let me pose, it's not quite a follow-up, but, but there is a connection if you'll indulge me. You use the motif of uh, funerals and weddings. And I'm going to guess that most people prefer to go to weddings rather than funerals. And in your framing, the ought, as I hear it, and so maybe I'm hearing something that you don't intend, is that you're waiting for a wedding um, uh, and seem to be disappointed when there's a funeral. So these various efforts at cooperation are attempted and they collapse. They don't result in uh, longer uh, standing uh, uh, efforts. So if I were one of those people literally uh, at a funeral, having been on your graphs of having been tortured or killed, my guess would be I do not want uh, collaboration uh, a la Condor uh, taking place at all. So am I hearing an ought that is there or is not there? Am I reading into it? Um, why is it that I'm perceiving you're kind of wanting there to be this eventual culmination uh, in an alliance? regardless of the nature of the parties that are involved. Right. Great. So this is more of a normative uh, question, I think. Um, that's a really good question. Historians are good for some. Sure. <laughs> I do not want, and I've written elsewhere about this, I don't want to be teleological about this and just sort of walk backwards from Mercosur and say, you know, when, when does this start? Why didn't it happen earlier? Surely this was inevitable. Um, it, it certainly wasn't. Um, I think normatively, sure. I'm interested in not so much cooperation, but why it works sometimes and doesn't in others. So I'm, I was intrigued by the puzzle of leaders seeking something and failing to get it, particularly when the people on the other side of the table actually agreed with them. Um, this was interesting to me. And for all the many, many books written by Argentine and Brazilian scholars about this relationship, um, I think some of these critical episodes, the summits, there simply wasn't any scholarship on them. Right? Um, so I thought this was an, an opportunity to dive in analytically um, and to, to explain the maintenance of rivalry by focusing on something active, something visible, something behavioral. Yes, I think that when cooperation shows up, and this does get back to the Condor point, it's sometimes uh, not desirable from the standpoint of the citizenry, right? That there are, there are un, unintended uh, consequences. Or intended consequences. Or intended consequences, right, absolutely. So the the phrase that I think shows up in the book about this is about silver linings, um, which, which may be a, a, more, a more balanced way. Um, and that looking at the dirty wars, the internal repressive acts, which are horrible, and I'm not at all saying that the 
benefits of these sorts of things outweigh the cost. But given that these regimes are doing them, one of the surprising things is that there's an international collaboration that comes out of this as a, as a silver lining. Um, and this, a brief segue into international relations theory, for liberals, right, or for, for the great majority of IR liberal work that is looking at things like the democratic peace, and this is an alternative argument I look at in the book, where you really expect co international collaboration to happen when countries are under civilian rule, elected democratic rule. It's really surprising that the breakthrough comes under the dictatorships, right? And I think this is part of the reason why. I think that civilians would have had a much harder time delivering this sort of cooperation. So I don't know how to assess the normative trade-offs, but, I, but I, I do think that sometimes you get uh, a useful foreign policy breakthrough in the midst of some really nasty stuff domestically. Yeah, we'll go way down here. Start. Um, ben Hopkins, George Washington University. Uh, Christopher, thanks a lot. That was a really um, clear and engaging presentation. Um, I just wonder specifically on Argentina for the, for the late 70s. I mean, um, I know your model talks about repurposing away from an internal or external threat to an internal threat, yet at the same time, I mean, isn't the Argentine military um, seeing the emergence of a different threat or the reemergence of Chile as, as a threat? I mean, you almost have them going to war with the people channel in 78. <coughs> So I just wonder if, if, um, if you're not overstating the, the rise of the internal threat, but if there are other um, threat reassessments going on for both these actors right. at this point in time. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, and I, I do talk a bit about the Argentine-Chilean relationship in the, the context of their own rivalry and the breakthrough in, in 84 in a, a different chapter in the book. For people studying foreign policy analysis and the assessment of Cold War threats, Argentina under the Proceso, the process of national reorganization, which is the name of the 1976 to early 1980s uh, junta, is really fascinating and really bizarre. Um, so trying to figure out how they're assessing the traditional Brazil rivalry, the traditional Chile rivalry, which is escalating over the course of the late uh, 1970s to the brink of war in 78, and the ongoing dispute with the United Kingdom over the Falklands Malvinas, plus the internal security operations, is really interesting. One of the things that I think comes through relatively clearly about the Argentine deliberations is looking at which organizational actors are championing responding to which threats. Um, and what I think comes through is that the Argentine army is really taking the lead on the internal repression. And the Argentine army's traditional mission here had been dealing with the Brazil rivalry. And they get out of the way of that, and they endorse cooperation with Brazil. So there you can really see a shift. We're doing the internal stuff. We're getting out of the way of the Brazil threat. And so when you look at who's beating the drum for conflict with Chile, it's largely the Navy. And then the Navy's ambitions there are frustrated because ultimately there is not a war. So who then beats the drum to deal with the Malvinas in 82? It's largely the Navy. And Galtieri, who's an army general, who's the uh, dictator of Argentina at that point, he's an army general, but he takes power in large part because he's got the Navy backing him against some of his army rivals. So I think at the, at the organizational level, that's where we see the trade-offs more clearly rather than at the national level. But yes, the Chile threat is, is in the background. And those are the two strands in, Ar in Argentine scholarship looking at this. One is, well, Figueredo had lived here in exile and he loves us. Um, and the other one is, well, it's the Chile threat that then pushes uh, Argentina into the arms of Brazil. And I, so I deal with those, but I, I don't agree. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Julie Pareto. I'm a presidential manager fellow at the U.S. Army Center of Military History. Um, I was wondering if there's anything you could say about the sort of sub-presidential meetings uh, that happened sort of in the lead up to these bigger presidential events, um, particularly what happens when the foreign ministries of Argentina talk to the foreign ministries of Brazil. Um, I ask this in part because you mentioned uh, also that a lot of what was agreed to in 1980 is already agreed to. So I was wondering if it's agreed to in sort of these smaller meetings leading up to it and what happens when you bring those into the picture. Great. 
A um, couple of couple of answers in response. What what happens when the presidents aren't in the room and you don't have the the major photo ops, right? Yes, foreign ministers are meeting repeatedly. Um, you obviously have ongoing lower level background diplomacy. In addition, Argentina and Brazil are embedded in a number of regional and sub regional uh, fora where they are negotiating on the on the sidelines. Um, in part, just as part of the scope of the project. I'm drilling down into the main summits and their surrounding months. So there, rather than saying this is going to be the archives 1945 to 1980 and try to cover the whole span. So I'm trying to narrow and drill down on these episodes. So there's years. You know, if you ask me what was the you know, foreign minister of Argentina doing in uh, August of 1965, I haven't looked as closely because I was focusing on these events. So that may be an omission. I think that's a, that's a great point. Um, where I have looked at it the closest was walking backwards from the breakthrough in 1980 and, and walking all the way back to the, the coup in, in 76 in Argentina. So there I've got more of a, a fine-grained assessment. Um, in particular, in December of 1976, there is a meeting of South American foreign ministers in Brasilia. Um, and the Argentine military sends its foreign minister. The first few foreign ministers under the dictatorship, by the way, were retired Navy admirals. So the military sort of colonizes the foreign ministry um, during, during the dictatorship. Um, and the Argentines and the Brazilians actually get along well, right? Before any presidential breakthrough, there's this sense for a couple of months after the foreign minister's meeting of December of 1976 that something might be possible. But then you have three years of backsliding where people make a formal proposal and then renege on it um, and a lot of undermining. So I don't see sort of uh, low-level cooperation that spirals that then really sets the ground for anything until after the structural factors are in place, until after the, the uh, economy is starting to tank. Um, so I think it's a really important part of the story over the course of 78, 79, as the diplomats are taking the lead and, and hammering out all these agreements for subsequent presidential signature. But in some of the earlier summits, it's very clear that even during the meeting, presidents are coming up with new stuff on the fly that has not been previously previously vetted. But I haven't looked in as much detail at some of those sub-cabinet, cabinet level or sub-cabinet level summits, but there are a number of them. Uh, two questions. Uh, the graph of bilateral agreements showed like, uh, as you know, a big spike in 1980, but then there was virtually nothing after that until 1986 when they became sustained. So could one make the argument that 1980 was a blip? And it wasn't until like actually got democratic government in place in '86 that that's when the cooperation truly uh, took hold and was permanent. Uh, and the second question was, can end runs and personal diplomacy ever work? Uh, you paint a sort of depressing picture that it's bureaucracy it, is all power and the presidents can't really do anything. Uh, are there cases where personal diplomacy can work? And is your something that doesn't is that? apply for all of the club nationalists in all countries, or is this more Latin American or a developing countries <clears throat> context where this applies? Great. Thank you. Great questions. Um, is 1980 a blip? Um, I'm arguing no, and I have sort of two reasons for that. There we go. First of all, there's never a year with zero. There's always something. Yes, not a lot is going on in the early 80s. Um, but there are a few things, and you certainly have nobody, even at the height of the debt crisis, calling for a return to rivalry. It's simply not there. Um, additionally, there's a few substantive things, building additional bridges. So that I showed the photo op in 47 where they're inaugurating the first bridge, but the militaries are also saying we need more bridges so that we can ship goods across the border and actually do some trade. Um, so they, uh, they, they do have a few substantive accords. In fact, there's a president, there are two presidential meetings in 1980. There's another one in 81. Uh, every Argentine military president meets with his Brazilian counterpart o over this period of time. So I think there's a, and I actually have a, an article in International Studies Quarterly that sort of is a sequel to the book that really looks at Argentina-Brazil in the 1980s, making this point that there's really deep continuity between this 1980 breakthrough and the Treaty of Asunción in 1991 that launches Mercosur. Uh, 
right? You do not see a rupture with democratization. You do not see a rupture with the debt crisis. Very quietly, the military is okay with this policy of cooperation continuing. So I don't see that as a blip. Um, and also, again, this is a really crude metric of whether countries are cooperating. This is just sort of a, a first cut because you want to look at the substance of the accord um, how, and how, how supported it is. Um, but I do see it as a, as a turning point. Can end runs work? Can personal diplomacy work? Can public diplomacy work? I think that's a fascinating and really unanswered question, and I'm curious about this for future research as well. My take from Cold War Latin America is I simply do not see any cases of it happening, categorically. Um, I do not think that's a universal. I don't think this rises to some sort of axiom of foreign affairs. I think it gets at an issue of scope conditions. Right? In other words, for which countries and governments and time periods are these bureaucratic actors really powerful enough to exert that kind of veto pressure? Um, and for all the work done on you know, bureaucratic politics and civil military relations in the United States or the Soviet Union during the Cold War, um, I don't think for those countries that these pressures were as acute. Um, and to take the, the counterexample would be the Honduran Constitution of 1957 says in writing that the president is not commander-in-chief of the armed forces. The armed forces get to determine their own budget. They can do that in secret. Um, so the principal agent problems of presidents and bureaucracies play out differently in different countries. And I think that that, if, that varies by level of development. There may be some regional cultural things that go on in there. And I haven't systematically explored the exact outer boundaries of this argument. But for Cold War Latin America, I'm deeply skeptical and somewhat depressed um, that these presidential diplomatic efforts routinely fail. And the flip side of that also, thinking more uh, on rational choice terms, if they routinely fail, why do people keep doing them? Particularly if it's occasionally dangerous. Um, that also I find really puzzling and I wonder to what extent it's about hubris, to what extent it's about gambling for resurrection, sort of prospect theory, risk taking. I don't know, but I think it's a great question. <laughs>